we promised at the outset of this investigation we would not relent until we uncovered the truth of Jared's murder, the whole and entire truth. This morning, a Fourth Circuit grand jury indicted Shannon Gardner for first-degree murder, conspiracy to commit first-degree murder, solicitation to commit first-degree murder, and child abuse, all related to the murder of Jared Brightigan, Shannon's ex-husband. We will be filing a notice of our intent to seek the death penalty, as we have also done in the case of Mario Fernandez. This investigation has uncovered the truth of Jared's murder. Henry Tennant did not act alone, Mario Fernandez did not plan alone, and Shannon Gardner's indictment acknowledges her central and key role in the cold, calculated, and premeditated murder of Jared Brightigan. Big, big, big developments in this case. This is the case of Shannon Gardner. She was in court today. Um, she comes from a lot of money. She's got a high-powered defense attorney. His name is Jose Baez. Um, she's been accused of orchestrating the murder of her ex-husband. Big child custody battle going on for years, for seven years. Um, and then her ex-husband is, is, is murdered. The man who actually did the murder has already pleaded guilty. Henry Tennant is his name. Uh, he's admitted what he did, and he's going to be testifying as a witness for the prosecution. Meanwhile, the new husband of Shanna Gardner, Mario Saldana, and Shanna Gardner facing the death penalty. So everything's at stake here. They're in court today, and it seems like a big, big problem. Some attorney-client communications and, and on a phone uh, digitally were uploaded. And prosecutors are not supposed to do that. You, you, you're not supposed to do it. It took him a while to, to solve this case. So while the investigation is going on, she's talking to her lawyer. He's talking to his lawyer. That's a big, big issue. Here's what happened today inside the courtroom. Ever since you all filed this motion um, with the court, to me, because there is no guidance um, in a situation like this, this is probably, I don't know if it's a first impression, but at least it hasn't been litigated on an appellate level. It seems more practical um, to me to handle the disqualification. I'll give you the time. I'll make the time. Um, if you all are prepared, I, I wanted to do it sooner rather than later, and then I could still honor all of the things that you put into this motion. I'll give um, Ms. Gardner the hearing that she's entitled to. Yes, Judge. Right? But if you all have concerns about potential evidence that they would present in order to meet or not meet their burden, um, then I'd rather hear that out first. And I, I do understand the concern about getting up to speed. Um, let's say, I, hypothetically, I do disqualify the state attorney's office. I, I'm, I'm cognizant of that. But, you know, the state uh, should be able to burn the midnight oil in my mind and get that prepared. Not only are we asking you to um, disqualify the entire fourth uh, judicial circuit, when the governor, I assume, does the governor's assignment for the new prosecu uh, prosecution team, we're going to want all of the electronic data, electronic data to be sent to a new filter team so that there is no way that this can happen again. Um, so that the new state attorney that gets the case has it completely sent through a filter team so they don't end up with our text messages, our emails, our attachments, our timelines, and every other thing that the state had access to and is in possession of. So that's going to be a, a, another delay that the state can't burn the midnight oil on because that's going to have to happen in our minds for this case to be uh, secure and non-prejudicial uh, to the defendants. We're going to move to actually dismiss the indictment, Judge, based on the fact that the state and its law enforcement officers, and this is sworn testimony, were reviewing uh, both Ms. Gardner's uh, iCloud return and her Google Drive return before it ever went through the Taint team, that that was knowing and intentional acts by uh, the um, law enforcement team that was working with the state, and that when they had questions when reviewing those, about whether or not something they were actually looking at was attorney-client privilege, they would call Ms. Stifler and ask her, describe it to her, 
and ask her if what they were looking at was in fact attorney-client privileged communications. There was an agreement between parties to send cell phone devices, MacBooks, Apple Watch, and an iPad through a team. team. The Jacksonville Beach Police Department executed over 70 search warrants in this case, including to Google and to iCloud. They receive that information directly as the affiant custodian of those records. Those records are at Jacksonville Beach Police Department, just like any other evidence for any case we stored with the presiding law enforcement agency. There is one document that we discovered while reviewing this evidence that I believe is evidence. I don't believe it's one, it's communication, or two, it's a confidential, or in any way, a privileged attorney-client communication. That document was brought to my attention by our analyst. I reviewed it. I determined that there was nothing about it that suggested it was from an attorney to an attorney, et cetera. I mentioned it to Mr. Dreiser, and we are disputing that one document. The rest of what they're talking about is the state of Florida never had possession of any of these items. They were in the possession of a law enforcement agency. Once we realized that there were attorney-client privileges, documents, or text messages on this, this information, which we have purposefully taken folders, left them sealed and zipped and didn't review them, the analysts were reviewing other evidence that was not attorney-client privilege, those were then sent through the Taint team. The state of Florida and law enforcement has never read any emails, any text messages, any client communications other than this one document. The state attorney's office agrees. I read this one document. I intend to use it. I'm going to ask the chief judge um, to appoint um, another judge to review these materials. I don't want to have access to it. I don't want to review it um, for um, a number of reasons. How big of a problem is this potential? Let's bring back in our think tank, Bernardo Villalona, Brian Watkins, Ben Chu. Uh, Brian, could this sink the whole case for the prosecution? They want the, the attorneys disqualified, the state attorney disqualified. The judge is not going to sink a murder case based on something like this. You know, what's going to happen is they will get new, the state will substitute that old team out. They'll bring in a new prosecutorial team that didn't have access to any of these emails or correspondence, and they're gonna prosecute the case for murder. You're not gonna beat a murder case on a technicality like that. And there's no attorney-client communication that would be so devastating that if the pro prosecution knew, it would blow the case apart. So uh, clearly the judge is gonna weigh that, what the communications were, you know, how, how much is the defendant prejudiced, but you're no way gonna get a murder case kicked on a technicality like this. All right, another big development in this case. Uh, take a look at this. Uh, this is revealed now. There was an application for an order authorizing the interception and recording of communications, like wiretap, getting, you know, text messages, all that sort of stuff. And, and here's the part that stuck out to us. For reasons that will be outlined in greater detail, the investigation has identified five people likely involved in a conspiracy to murder Jared Bridegan. Five people. There's only three people charged here. The hitman, you see him on the top, the ex-wife, and the ex-wife's new husband. Who are these other two people? How important could they be in all this, and why aren't they charged? Um, Bernardo Villaloni, you have any uh, theories on this? It's possible that they, well, they definitely know who those two other people are. It's possible that they may be using them as cooperators. Um, that's if, if they have enough evidence to charge them and they decided to flip them without charging them. There's a lot still that we need to look into. I think it's still too premature to find out exactly what's going on with those two people. I mean, they don't disclose the name of those two individuals. It could be because they're still investigating them to decide at a later time to prosecute them. So many variables. All right, Ben Chu, here's the situation. Shanna Gardner, the ex-wife, who obviously is the one that's in the custody battle, has claimed she's innocent in, in all of this. She has lots of money from her family. They've spent money on her defense. They've spent a lot of money to bring in Jose Baez, uh, an attorney who has a knack for convincing jurors that people are not guilty. He's done it several times right here on Court TV. Um, how much of an advantage is that for someone who's going to trial? The money? And do you see a difference between 
the way a jury would see her versus her new husband, who's also been charged, but will not have access to the same level of funding? It's a great question, Vinny. I think certainly the resources and having access to a successful, a proven attorney is a, is a huge advantage. I mean, uh, but ultimately, uh, the, the, some of these facts may be difficult uh, for for them to overcome. But I think he definitely, she definitely has an advantage over her new husband. Yeah, I also think uh, she may be pointing the finger at the new husband. How about that? She dropped a little hyphen from her name. That's gone. So we'll see. Stay where you are.